Gospel of St. Matthew and the 12th chapter. Happy Sabbath. Matthew 12. And I'm going to read, starting in verse 43. This is quite a vignette of Christ thought. When the unclean spirit is gone out of a man, he walketh through dry places, seeking rest and findeth none. Now note, the vignette starts with the unclean spirit already having been in the man and now going out of the man. Seeking rest and findeth none. That is the unclean spirit. The end of verse 43. Verse 44. Then he saith, I will return into my house from whence I came out. And when he is come, he findeth it empty, swept, and garnished. The unclean spirit leaves the house. And then he checks back on this house. And when he does so, he finds the house not only swept clean, but also empty. Also empty. Then goeth he. Now, that means the unclean spirit leaves the second time. Then goeth he and taketh with himself seven other spirits. He goes and finds seven other demons like unto himself. This is better than soap opera, man. <laughs> I'm locked in this already. So forgive me if I forget about you. I'm, I'm in this story now. I, I'm trying to figure out what is going on here. Then goeth he, like the way the Bible talks, then goeth he and taketh, you know, old time stuff, with himself seven other spirits more wicked than himself. And they enter in and dwell there. And the last state of that man is worse than the first. Even so, now the application, even so, he's bringing it home to us, even so, shall it be also with this wicked generation. May the Lord add blessing to the reading of his word. Let's pray. Lord, this is your Sabbath. These are your people. This is your camp meeting. I'm using your word. I am your preacher. Use it all. Amen. It's not a very familiar passage of Scripture. It's tucked in this 12th chapter of Matthew. And yet, typical of Christ, the truths contained in the passage are deeper than the bottom of an iceberg. In chapter 12, Christ is unfolding some truths we've been talking about and preaching about thus far. This whole business of this magnificent obsession, this hunger that Christ has for us, and having demonstrated his hunger for us, then he wants us to have a hunger for others. That's the essence of this magnificent obsession. Christ finds us irresistible, and Christ wants us to find the salvation of others irresistible to the church. Can you say amen? amen? Last evening, we looked at this issue through this experience 
that we found in another passage. And that experience left us understanding just how involved Christ is in our salvation. Uh, we pictured the church by the pool. Remember that? And all of these broken people, and then Christ singling out this one man, singling out this one brother, and asking this question, Wilt thou be made whole? And understanding that a part of the wholeness isn't just Christ healing us from sin, isn't just Christ healing us from sin, but a part of that wholeness is us taking on the mission of Christ. And now today, I want to deal with having taken on the mission having taken on Christ, how do we maintain? How do we maintain? Let's be frank about it. The most frustrating and sometimes discouraging thing about being a Christian is our own inconsistency. Ah, don't be half-baked. Say amen. We're not reliable. Well, I'm going to get personal. You're not reliable. And every time Christ thinks he can count on us, we just mess up. And you look back over your life and you're a roller coaster up and down, down and up, back and forth. And really, Jesus deserves a hand of applause because who else would put up with that junk but Jesus? And so, my brother, I want to focus. I want to focus on having received him. How do we maintain it? And that's what this story is about. Now, it begins in chapter 12 with uh, the first eight verses. He talks about the true meaning of Sabbath keeping, and he demonstrates it by uh, he and disciples picking some corn there in the field. And then, uh, the, of course, the Pharisees are upset with that. The Pharisees don't want anybody to enjoy the Sabbath. <laughs> I always like to have a little double whammy in my sermon. Yeah. And so then Jesus, Jesus ignores them and goes on in their face and heals the withered hand of this man and, and lets them know that I don't care how you feel about the Sabbath and how you want to lock me up, the Sabbath is for getting folks straight, for lifting folk out of their misery. And then he talks in verses 14 through 21 about his true mission, that he's come here to seek and to save those that are lost. And they criticize him some more. They question his act. And Jesus makes the statement in Matthew 12, 25 and 26, every kingdom divided against itself is brought to desolation. And if Satan cast out Satan, he's divided against himself. Now, he introduces Satan into this, this narrative. And that's going to come up in the focus verses. It is the insertion of Satan to the conversation that will prompt Christ to tell the story we will focus on today. And then Jesus makes a statement in verse 30 that is predictive of where I'm going today as I talk to us. He says, He that is not with me is against me, and he that gathereth not with me scattereth abroad. He's simply saying that the mission of Christ must be interpreted by Christ, not by mankind. And that Christ himself's mission is one focused goal, and that's to bring people to Christ and then to keep them in Christ. Now, where's the chapter going? The person who doesn't stay in Christ, listen to this simple sentence. Those folk back there in that balcony, listen. The person who is not, well, it's hard to keep your attention when you're way back up there. <laughs> Y'all with me up there? All right, I love them, I love them, I love them. Simple sentence, simple sentence. The person who is not in to Christ, filled with Christ, will eventually, will eventually be overcome by sin and Satan. See, the work of the Holy Spirit is to bring you to Christ. But then, young lady, you must be filled with Christ. See, a simple summary, Jerry, of this sermon is this. 
the, the devil left him. He was found with the devil leaving. There was some revival. There was some change. There was some impact of the word. So the devil left. But the problem was, after he had this spiritual encounter, he didn't become filled. Are you listening to me? You've got to do more than give up sin. You've got to take on Jesus. Oh, wait a minute, wait a minute. I, I want to make sure you get that. You must do more than just give up evil. You must take on he who is only good. See, the Pharisees who are challenging him in this passage, the Pharisees, they gave up Sabbath breaking. They gave up eating unclean foods. They gave up not paying tithe, but they crucified Jesus. And so Jesus chides them and says, you can't take the work of Christ, my work, and attribute it to the devil. You must understand that when the devil departs, there's no two ways about it. When the devil departs, Christ must come in and take control. And if he doesn't, then the devil will take over. Listen to the story in another version. Listen, listen. You realize, of course, modern version, that when a demon is cast out of a man, he's very restless until he finds another victim. He keeps his eyes on the old victim who looks tremendously inviting to him. You do know that you're appealing to the devil. You're his best buddy. The devil gets more evil done through human beings than anybody else. Why are you getting so quiet? He then goes, continuing this modern version, he then goes to his fellow demons and invites several others to join him. Together they go back and find that they are able to gain possession of that man again. See, that's that up and down experience. I go to camp meeting last year, make vows, maybe walk down the aisle, maybe take my stand. And this sermon is especially for those who've just come into the church. Folks, you've got to do more than come in the church. Anybody can join a church. Staying in Christ, that's the challenge. <laughs> Together they go back and they are able to gain possession of that man again because, because, I like the modern version, he didn't let the Holy Spirit fill his heart. Have you noticed in your Christian life, you're going along and things go pretty well, kind of go through a period where things are going pretty well just kind of breezing along. And then things start happening, boom, 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 boom. Ever been there? Uh, just recently, my wife and I came back from a surgery, got back in end of May, surgery on May 12. And over the past couple of weeks, you know, the devil just gets busy. And let me, let me give you my list. And I want you to have sympathy for me. My lawnmower went down. Oh, no, 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 no. Lawnmower went down. TV went bad. <laughs> Slipped and fell down the steps. No, that's better. That's better. <laughs> I'm, I'm going somewhere. I'm going somewhere. It's night entertainment. Fell down the steps. Then I'm driving. Had to put my car in for service. Driving my niece's car. And somebody hits me in the back. Now I want a real all coming up next. <laughs> pick up my car. Pick up my car after it's been repaired. Trying to squeeze into a parking spot with a fence on this side and scratch and dent the side of my car. <laughs> now, I'm 66 years old, so you don't report that to the insurance company. Let's all of us old folks say amen. Amen. Oh, they got us an old one here. He can't even make a parking spot. We're going to raise this insurance three times. 
Now, I'm going somewhere with this. We're talking about the devil keeps coming back. And just assault, assault, assault. And then I'm backing out of the garage in my wife's car and scratch up the mirror on this side. Then the air conditioning goes out in our house in Washington, D.C., where there's humidity. It goes out twice. Get it fixed. Guy comes. We left the house coming here. No air conditioning. Now, now, stay with me. Stay with me. Stay with me. What the devil does to you, and it happens to all of us, the devil tries to make you think that the Lord does not care. Come on, somebody. That the Lord does not care. And he just pesters. He pesters. He pesters. He nips. He bites. You can't seem to get a break. And you've got to remember, ladies and gentlemen, that if you are really filled with Christ, he gives you the expansion to handle that stuff. But if you're empty, you can't take it. You simply can't take it. You fall apart, Harris. You go back to the old ways. You find yourself using the old words because you've not built something inside to strengthen you against the pressures of this world. This planet is insane. I know. I live here. You too. The translation continues, need to be careful that by rejecting the work of the Holy Spirit, you don't become more evil than you already are. This is a wicked generation. Now I'm going to try it again, Jan, this time in another version. It gets better. Message Bible. I like this, Jerry. When a defiling spirit is expelled from someone, it drifts along through the de desert looking for an oasis. Some unsuspecting soul, it can be devil. When it doesn't find one, it says, I'll go back to my old haunt. On return, it finds the person spotlessly clean. I'm going to deal with that but vacant. It then runs out and rounds up seven other spirits more evil than itself, and they all move in, whooping it up. <laughs> the person ends up far worse off than if he'd never gotten cleaned up in the first place. That's what this generation is like. You may think you have cleaned out the junk from your lives and gotten ready for God. But because you were not hospitable to my kingdom message, now all the devils are moving back in. What are the issues? What am I after here? One Bible scholar says that this little parable, this little vignette, it's really an allegory. It's not a parable, it's an allegory. The, first of all, it refers to the Israeli nation who, after the Babylonian captivity, had the evil spirit of idolatry cast out of them, swept clean, but did not become rooted in faith and love to God to fill the void. They chose instead, listen, works righteousness, dead men's bones. I told you this before here at Central California Conference. I'm going to say it again. No apology. The most dangerous thing about being a Seventh-day Adventist is being a Seventh-day Adventist. Folk, I love this church. You can't hear me preach without knowing Henry Munro Wright loves the Seventh-day Adventist Church. But I understand this church. And because we are so laced together with rules and regulations and things to do and various doctrines and policies and teachings, 
We get wrapped up in that. We wrestle with each other over it. We split hairs over things that don't mount to a hill of beans. Things that will never get you to heaven. You know, we'll spend an hour debating as to whether sanctification is the work of a lifetime. I don't care if it's the work of a lifetime or the work of a minute. I just want to be sanctified. And then we'll go further and we'll debate, when does justification stop and sanctification start? Who cares? I'm wrestling with temper. I got bills I got to pay. I got habits I need to get over. I don't care when justification starts and stops. Just justify me and sanctify me, Holy Ghost, anytime you get ready. My point is, ladies and gentlemen, that we tend in this church to wrestle with each other over stuff that's not important. What we need is to be filled with the Spirit of Christ. Then even when we disagree, like Ellen White wrote about the 1888 uh, Righteous by Faith Conference, she says that God was less concerned at that conference with who was right and more concerned about the mean spirit with which the brethren discussed the things one with another. In all the parables of the Bible, Herbert Lockyer says that the cleansing ministry, as he swept clean, uh, was announced by Jesus and John the Baptist when he said, Repent. This message was that we must get rid of the pollution. We must clear out the way, but we must do more. The parable pictures this brother. He's symbolic of all of us, probably a member of the church, probably a husband, a father, provider, uh, was a man that went to work every day, perhaps, uh, uh, wrestled with various habits and temptations. He was flawed genetically like all the rest of us. Remember, the parable starts with him with a devil born in sin, shaped in iniquity. We're born with sin. We're born with tendencies, born with weaknesses. But then we have an encounter with Christ, and Christ cleans us out. There's a revival. He meets Jesus. Uh, the parable starts with him having a tremendous encounter with the Lord, a critical moment in his story. He cleans out. Last camp meeting somebody, cleaned out. Maybe in the last uh, evangelistic campaign, evangelistic campaign somebody, cleaned out. Maybe somewhere in your private closet as you prayed to God, you cleaned out, you swept clean, you put things aside. But it can't stop there. How do we fill in? How do we fill in? See, in John 8:31, Jesus makes this troubling statement. He says, "If you continue in my word, then you are my disciples." See, the key is continuing. It's continuing. It's continuing. Now, let me give you a discouraging word, but with encouragement. The discouraging word is this. I'm talking to these folk over here and you ought to listen. <laughs> Hear me. As your walk with Christ increases, then the test in your life will too. But if as your walk with Christ increases, the tests increase, because your walk with Christ is increasing in Christ. Then the more the devil hurls your way, it makes no difference because Christ is big enough to handle it. Just make room for him. Stop holding on to yourself. You're swept clean. Get it all out. Get all. The, get it all out sweep clean get it out get self out of your bedroom get self out of your den get self out of your attic get self out of your basement get self out of your living room get self out of your bathroom get self out so when Christ moves in none of your junk is left Amen. 
Why? Because according to the little allegory, the devil keeps checking back. When I was born, they tell me that I could not hold food. My mother had to suckle me with a little molasses on her finger. Only thing I could keep down. The devil tried to kill me when I was a baby. When I was nine, I got bronchitis. I coughed for a solid year. I walked around with a little bottle of, of uh, that's back when doctors, now don't get upset with me doctors. That's back when doctors, you know, came to your house. And, and, and actually visited you. <laughs> Dr. Torrance, he charged two dollars. <laughs> Sorry, now I'm not, not sending any messages, not sending any messages. <laughs> I'm just telling you what happened, okay? Call for a year. That started my lung disease, which later manifested itself here in my life. When I graduated from Oakwood, the summer I graduated, a car ran a stop sign, hit my car. I still don't remember the accident. Had amnesia for three days. The only thing that brought me back was a picture of my girlfriend. Her name was Carol Yvonne Wright. Hallelujah, Jesus. The, the psychologist used the picture to bring back my... You see, Carol's more to me than my wife. She's my, she's my whole common sense, y'all. I mean, <laughs> brought me back. Now, what I'm saying is, what I'm saying is, the devil has hounded me all of my life. You can tell the same story. That's what the parable is saying. The devil keeps checking back. But if... If he comes back and he finds Jesus in the house, hey, he can look through the window, but he can't get in. Somebody say amen out there. And that's the problem with the story. That's why Jesus tells it. He's saying, look, the man did fine. He swept clean. He continued in the Word. He studied the Word. The Word became quick in his soul. Uh, he, he filled himself up so he would not sin against God. But the relationship, the pal, the closeness, the warmth with Jesus was not there. Jesus never felt comfortable. So when the devil in this life came back, Jesus was still on the outside. He swept clean. He put down old stuff, but he didn't let Christ become the center of his life. There's a reason why, my brother. Ellen White wrote that when the image of Christ is perfectly reproduced in his people, then Jesus will come. It doesn't say when Adventists become perfect Sabbath keepers. It doesn't say when Adventists put down every piece of meat in their life. It doesn't say when Adventists pay every dime of tithe they've ever owed. No, it says when God's people reproduce Jesus perfectly, then He will come. Now, He's not saying we're going to become perfect Christians. He's saying, open up. Let Christ in. Let Him dominate. Let Him dominate. Then I can trust you in heaven. He swept clean. He studied the Word deeply. What's your worship life like? You see, Sabbath school teacher, you've got to do more than just study so you can handle all the tough questions in the class. 
you have to study your Sabbath school lesson and beyond to the point that your heart is broken and humbled by the majesty of God. Uh, preacher, preacher, preachers, my brethren in this work whom I love with all my heart, we've got to do more than be experts in worship, experts in homiletics, experts in administration. We must be filled with Jesus Christ. For well, the same preacher who says to you that the biggest danger of Adventism is Adventism says to the preachers the biggest danger of ministry is ministry itself. We get caught up in the things and the process and the glory of the preaching and the amens and the adulation. None of that will get you to glory. But if you're connected with Jesus, I said, if you're connected with Jesus, if Christ is all up and down inside of you, then you have something that cannot be broken by life situations. It's going to get rougher out there. He swept clean. I like what, uh, and some of us don't, don't like the book, The Purpose Driven Life. That's all right. I do. And the author says, the Bible is far more than a doctrinal guidebook, said the Adventists. God's Word generates life, creates faith, produces change, frightens the devil. Come on, somebody. Causes miracles, heals hurts, builds character, transforms circumstances, imparts joy, overcomes adversity, defeats temptation, infuses hope, releases power, cleanses our minds, brings things into being, guarantees our future. The Bible is more than something to carry around and tell other people how right we are and how wrong they are. The Bible is a book that should not only sweep clean, but then fill you with Christ, its author. He was empty, clean, but empty. It comes from a Greek word that means to be free from occupation, leisure. Herbert Lockyer writes, listen, no one is safe whose life is empty of a deep connection with Jesus Christ. Doing no harm is not a condition that will continue unless we take to doing good. In other words, let me put it to you this way. It's not how many sins. Listen. It's not how many sins, listen, it's not how many sins you don't commit. It's how much good you do. Did you follow that? I've been thinking, Jerry, about the magnificent obsession. Now listen to me, folks. Listen to me. We can get hooked up on prayer, Bible study, and worship. Those are all good things. And Seventh-day Adventists are good at all. Prayer, Bible study, and worship. But there's a fourth leg to the life. It's Christian service. It's doing good for others. Think about it this way. If in our churches we spent less time talking about one another and doing for one another, how different our churches would be. See, the young woman in your church whether the child out of wedlock how many baby things did you send for the baby the young man in your church who's locked up for using drugs how many letters of encouragement did you write while he was there the couple who's falling apart 
over divorce. How many prayers did you pray for them and words of encouragement did you send to them? You see, we've become so afraid of sinning. We've become so afraid of sinning. We've become equally afraid of doing and being Christ-like. The house was empty. Now look what happens. Let's finish the sermon. He didn't find a place to go. Verse 44. I will turn to my house from whence I came out. And when he comes, he finds it empty, swept and garnished. Okay? That's how far we've gotten. We're in verse 45. Then go with he. I want to focus on that. I want to paint a picture for you. This is your life. You've been in the church for years. This is your life. You maybe just got into the church. This is your life. And you've swept clean. You're doing all the basic things it takes to be a good Seventh-day Adventist Christian. But you're not filled with Christ. And Christ knows that. You move the devil out. You never move Jesus in. And Christ knows that. And so Christ, stay with this preacher. Stay with me, balcony. Stay with me. Christ knows the devil is checking back. Are you listening to me? He knows it. I got a text for you. He knows it. And so when Christ sees the devil come back to check on you, I'm now in Revelation 3. Where am I? Revelation 3. Go there. Revelation 3. Hurry up and get to Revelation 3. Verse 19. Jesus is talking to the empty house. Verse 19. Jesus is talking to the empty house. Go there as many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Be zealous, therefore, and repent. Verse 20. Verse 20. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. He sees the devil aiming to take control to come back. He never moved in, so he's still out to... You've never given him your all. You never got rid of your junk. You left too much self in, though you swept. And Jesus now, knowing the devil, wants to make his final move. Henry! Henry! Let me in! He knows when the devil comes back, he's going to peep in. He knows if the devil finds you empty, he's going to take charge. Henry! Let me in. Because Christ knows. Christ knows. When the devil comes back, if he knocks on the door, and Jesus, hallelujah, Jesus, hallelujah, walks to the door, hallelujah, and opens the door, the devil will run and hide. You can't open the door. You're not safe. You'll pin your bow. Henry! Next words are very moving to me. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice, he's not just knocking, y'all. He's calling. He's calling. Hoping you'll turn the stereo down. He's calling. Hoping you'll take the speakers out of your ears. He's calling. You're empty. Been in the church 40 years. You're empty. Just got baptized full of zeal. But you're not filled yet. And the devil never gives up. Henry, 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 open the door. Behold, I stand and knock. Because if you don't, he will move back in. And your last state will be worse than your first. Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls. I don't want to be in this church all these years and be empty. You've got to be in the Word. 
You've got to be in love with Christ. You'll find that in the Word. You've got to be filled with His passion. You've got to get involved with others. You've got to stop worrying about your own sins. You've got to stop fretting about your own faults. Get your mind off yourself. Do the work of Christ. Be filled with His love and His power. Knocking. Knocking. Today, on somebody's heart. Knocking, 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 knocking. I'm tired of you just coming to camp meeting and getting sermons and tape. Some of us have enough tapes of preachers to be saved 10,000 times. <laughs> Throw those confounded tapes of Henry Wright away. Read the Bible for yourself. People say to me, I've listened to your sermons 15 times. That does nothing for me. I'll be doing good to get to heaven myself. Forget my tapes. Find Christ in this Bible. Follow Him. Love Him. Obey Him. Be filled with Him. Why? Ain't gonna be no tapes in glory. Just Jesus. So get to know Him. Be filled with His power. Be filled with His presence. Be filled with His love. Be filled with His passion. Open the door. What's Christ doing? In Revelation 3.19, still outside the church. Why is he not inside? That text tears me up. Maybe I've got things in my closet I don't want him to see. Things in my refrigerator he wouldn't want to drink. Books under my mattress. Jesus would be embarrassed to read. Maybe that's why he's not in yet. Let him in today. Cue up Harris's music. Let him in today. Let him in today. Behold, I stand at the door. I want to fill your life. How many have experienced the grace and the mercy of Jesus Christ? Knocking, he's knocking. I, I want to thank you and praise you too. Your grace and mercy brought me through. I don't think you heard me the first time.
Father in heaven, our Father in heaven, we now offer you our hearts. Many of us have swept clean, but we're yet empty. Many of us have swept clean, but we're not yet really full. And so, Lord, according to your command, I now make three appeals. The first is to those who need to have that encounter with Christ to be swept clean, to have that agitating, cleansing moment this person in this allegory had. You've been coming to camp meeting. Maybe you came here with your pastor. Maybe you've been taking Bible studies. You've never really walked down the aisle and taken your stand for Jesus Christ and his church and his truth. The sermon has taught you that there is one who watches your life. He wants to possess you. You want him out. You want him out. And you want to keep him out. 
And so rather than making my first appeal some general appeal, some easy appeal that, that allows folk to kind of sneak in the door, no, I want someone today with courage who says, I need Jesus. Jesus does not dominate my life. I need his church, his truth in my life. I want it. If that's your need. And Christ's spirit is speaking to you while heads are bowed and eyes are closed. Please, folks, don't spend your time looking around to see who is. You want to come to Christ right now. Rise from your seat and come forward. Where are you? Where are you? Come on. Where are you? Come down here. Walk to Jesus. Walk to Jesus. Come on. Come on. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Walk to Jesus. Accept his word. Accept his church. Come. Come down. Don't be. Christ is not ashamed. Don't be ashamed of him. Come. That's it. That's it. Come. That's it. Come. 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 As one comes, that encourages others to come. Come. It's you and Christ now. It's you and Christ now. Come. 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 Let's let the first of you do its work. Come. Come. Come press right around this pool. This this symbol of cleansing. This symbol of being of being cleansed. Come. 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 With courage. Come. Not worrying about what anybody else thinks or says. Come. 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 His grace and mercy has seen you through as you are. Now let his grace and mercy sweep you clean. You come. You come. You come. Folk are finding courage all over this place. They're coming. They're coming. Hallelujah. Somebody ought to say hallelujah. Somebody ought to say thank you, Jesus. This is no longer Henry Wright's meeting. Holy Spirit now has taken full charge. He's in full charge. He's moving upon hearts. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Pastors are greeting those who are coming. Praise God. Praise God. Praise God. Praise God. Praise God. You're coming. You're coming. You're coming. Are they coming? Second appeal. Second appeal. This is even more serious. Your name might be on the church roll. You swept clean once, but you never got filled up. Listen to the pastor. You're empty. And your life in the church has been ragged, up and down and back and forth. But today, you understand that what you missed before was not the Sabbath, not the law, not the diet, not the diet. What you missed before was Christ in your life. And you want Christ, though your name is on the roll. Maybe you've not been going to church. You want Christ now to dominate your life. I want you to come now. I want you to come now. Your name's on the roll, but you're going to come. You're going to come. You're going to come. You're going to come. Here they come. Here they come. You're going to come. You're going to come. Here they come. Hallelujah, Holy Ghost. Here they come. Here they come. You're going to come. You're going to come. You're going to come responding to this second appeal. Because you may be a deacon coming, so folk will gossip. You may be an elder coming, so folk will whisper. You may be a choir member coming. Folk will wonder. It's none of their business. It's you and Jesus. It's you and Jesus. Just come. Just come. Just come. Just come. Just come. Press right in. Don't be afraid of this group here. Come right down. There's room. There's room. Come. Here they come. Here they come. Here they come. Here they come. Praise God. Praise God. Praise God. Look at this. Look at the Holy Spirit. Look at the Holy Spirit. Give God the glory. Look at the Holy Spirit working, 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 working. If you overthink, you won't come. If you worry about what people are thinking, you won't come. 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 They're coming. They're coming. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Pastor Page, when you jump in with me now, we've got to pray for these folks. These are courageous decisions. The first group came saying they want the Lord Jesus Christ in their life. The second group said, I don't care if my name's on the roll. I'm not filled yet. I want to be filled. They're coming. They're still coming. The balcony's not too far for you, my friend. If you need to come, they're still coming. Hallelujah. You say, why do pastors do this? Why this, why this coming forward? Ladies and gentlemen, every now and then, people ought to take a stand for Jesus. He took a stand for us. They're coming. Elder, come. 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 The screen is off. The clocks are off. No more seconds ticking off. We're off the air. We can just be us now. Have a good time and tell them what happened when, they, when, 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 they, when the screen went off. How good God worked. You can come quietly. Now the rest of us. We're just thankful that God's grace and mercy has seen us through. Why don't you stand on your feet? Come on. Let's close out with everybody standing. Amen.
Amen. Also, God is good. Oh, Jesus. This is what we live for. To see more coming to you. But Lord, our own lives, we're here, we're standing, Lord. We're, we're, we're needing you. We don't want you knocking on the outside, Jesus. Come on down the hallway. Take that room that we've been yeah, hiding yeah. from you, Lord. Clean up the, the TV room. Come on into the bedroom. Do other Lord, things, Jesus. Lord, whatever. Yes. Have the whole house. Thank you, Jesus. We so thank you, Lord, that when the enemy comes in like a flood, you set up your standard of righteousness against him. Hallelujah. For greater is the one that's in us than the one who's in the world. So, Lord, I'm praying for these dear ones, for this dear family here, for those that are still with us on television. Lord, I just pray that each one of us, this time, will let you obsess us with agape love for you the way you're obsessed for us. Lord, help us to pull out of the culture. Help us to, to love you with everything we have, to get into the book and not just listen to the CDs, Lord. Help us to know you personally listen, to, to love you. God, help us no longer to turn away from you so easy. We know our hearts. We, we're prone to wander, as the song said. But Jesus, Jesus, you have said that you will seal us. You will come in. You'll help us to have a new, new walk with you, so full. And God, everyone who's come to the altar today, take them all the way home. You said you can save to the uttermost all who come unto the Father by you. Thank you. We're going to be there on that sea of glass, Lord. We're going to Amen. talk about this, this Sabbath at SoCal and how it was the time. It was the time when you got a hold of us. Hallelujah. And Lord, send us all out now. We've got networks. We've got people that we know. We want, to, we want to see so many more there on that first morning, Lord. My mom and dad, our loved ones, the ones that have gone before, Lord, that have, that have passed away. We want to see them and we want to tell them what you've done and how you've helped others get there. Lord, we got family, we got kids, we got loved ones. Help us win them. Thank you so much, Jesus. We're praying for the outpouring of the Holy Spirit on everyone who's here. Baptize us afresh every day, every minute. Draw us to you, Lord. Help us to hate and be repulsed. Put enmity between us and the things of this world, we pray. We thank you for that. We glorify you. Thank you for Brother Henry. But thank you most of all that he got out of the way and you used him. We praise you for that in Jesus' name. Amen. Precious one.